I'm Norm Silverstein. Thanks for joining us. We're in good company today with James Norman, President and CEO of Action for a Better Community, also known as ABC. For the past 25 years, James has been a change agent. He's worked to change a system that keeps people trapped in poverty. He's worked to give people hope. James is recognized for his work as a leader, an advocate, and a role model. His tireless dedication to combating inequality and structural racism has certainly moved the conversation forward. As he opens his next chapter, we're pleased to have James join us to reflect on his life and work and to share his perspectives on where the community stands today and its challenges for the future. James, thanks Norm, for being with us. Thank you. More than 25 years working at community action agencies, what inspired you to devote such a, a long part of your life to helping people in need? You know, when I was uh, in junior high school, um, the class that made most sense to me was uh, psychology. Of all the classes I ever took, uh, maybe it was the instructor Mrs. Jordan, uh, but uh, I really uh, connected with the material and you know, led me into uh, degrees in the social sciences uh, through a master's degree. Um, and uh, I wanted to learn about you know, why certain problems existed and the ways that um, I could be um, a part of the solution. Um, you know, growing up, you know, my family was involved uh, in the community, uh, you know, through the church, and uh, so helping uh, was a natural part of what I thought people should do. Uh, so that's kind of how I got started. And that was in uh, Augusta, Augusta, Georgia. Georgia. You were one of how many children? Five, and I was in the middle. You were the middle, mm -hmm. and of course. Um, most people know your sister, Jessie yes. Norman, famous yes. opera singer. Yes. So I would guess that music was a big part of your life growing up? Yes, so we had a piano from the time I could remember, and uh, all of us at uh, different times took uh, piano lessons. Um, and the boys um, gravitated away to musical instruments. The girls uh, stayed with uh, singing and uh, playing the piano. Um, and so when I learned that I didn't have to take piano, I, I stopped taking <laughs> <laughs> Did you have some other role models uh, growing up that helped uh, shape your future? Uh, yes. Um, teachers, of course, um, along the way. Um, scout leaders, um, church leaders. So you didn't come here directly from Georgia. You no, spent some time in uh, Michigan. Yes, I did. Uh, when I finished undergraduate school, and I applied to graduate schools. I applied to schools outside of the Southeast um, with the idea that I needed to learn other parts of the country, and then I would return to Georgia um, and, and develop a career. Uh, what happened is that uh, when I was in my uh, second year of uh, graduate school in, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, I was working at an organization uh, that was um, making some management changes, uh, and. Um, Toward the end of the uh, internship, I was offered an opportunity. Um, and um, so my first professional mentor, Moses Walker, um, sort of took me on his wings and, and taught me how to work with funding sources, how to work with boards of directors, um, and things like that. And uh, so then I went from there to uh, work on another great leader, Ed Revis, uh, in Pontiac, Michigan, uh, who extended my learning um, that uh, led me to go to state government, and uh, eventually, um, when my governor lost the race, I had met a woman from Rochester, uh, and here I am. And she was uh, with Xerox. She was with Xerox, yes. And that's what brought you to Rochester. Yes. So you were already working in community action when, when you were in Michigan. Yes, I was. So it made some sense for you to look in that area, but uh, when you got here, I guess the founder of um, Action for a Better Community, uh, Mr. McCuller had just passed away. Yes, I started uh, looking uh, for work in Rochester once um, uh, my wife and I decided to get married because she was actually still working for Xerox, but she was on assignment in Michigan when we met. Uh, then she had to come back, and actually she came back a year before I came uh, because I still was working in Michigan. And uh, so when I applied, um, it made sense for me to apply for the ABC job because uh, prior to working for the state of Michigan, I worked in an agency just like ABC, and for nine of my 14 years working for the state, I oversaw the entire network of agencies like ABC throughout 
the state of Michigan. Um, and I had, I had heard rumors that there were different people that were going to get the job. But I felt if I got to the table, um, I would make some connections and ultimately uh, would land uh, you know, an opportunity. Uh, but uh, in that process, uh, one of the people that was uh, very, um, I guess, influential in the process decided that they were going to advocate for my candidacy, and, and so here I am. Well, that's when things got interesting, right? I heard that uh, <laughs> when you started, you were considered someone who was kind of in there and starting to shake things up. Yeah. Is that, that an honest uh, assessment? Well, that as well as, um, so you had different expectations. Um, you know, my predecessor um, had a, a different sort of approach to things than, than I took. Uh, and so him, him having been there 25 years as well, people wanted to see whether or not I was going to be like him, as good as him, or whatever. Um, and so it took me some time to establish myself as, as me, uh, not him. Um, you know, and of course, there needed to be changes in the organization uh, because it needed to you know, reach another level of maturity. Um, and so that required that we make some changes. Well, I heard that you got rid of some popular programs, but you, they weren't programs that you felt were really moving the community forward. Um, one was um, giving away turkeys on Thanksgiving. Yeah, you know, at, at Thanksgiving and at Christmas, there was a particular um, organizational unit that spent um, from September through December uh, giving out food. And looking at our mission and looking at the other resources in the community for uh, emergency assistance, uh, it seemed that we could still be true to our mission and not also do that. And so when I talked with the staff and explained that our job was to connect to people in a way that brings about a change in their life, not to keep them coming back every year to get a turkey, uh, they sort of agreed. And then I went to the board and made my proposal. And it didn't, it didn't go too well <laughs> because the people had pretty much given me the indication they were going to support it. Uh, they had already informed the board of what was coming, and so people were had their guns blazing, and and they sort of thought that um, I wasn't exhibiting the sensitivity I needed to exhibit uh, to the population. But that um, was a courageous thing because you wanted people to have self-sufficiency. That's correct. That's and, correct. You know, I understand you said at that time this is not solving hunger. That's right. It's, it's not teaching people how to fish. It's giving fishes. Or giving fish, I should say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you made it through that. Made it through that. And then uh, one of the next big challenges was um, dealing with some of the governance uh, structures that we had. Uh, because I had a 45-member board of directors. Uh, and if all of them came to a meeting, uh, they could not possibly fit in the boardroom. And it didn't seem that as we moved into a time of rapid change, uh, that it was practical uh, to have an organizational board that size for an organization like ABC. Uh, but already having had my you know, first experience with the board about those turkeys, um, you know, I sort of approached it gradually. And actually, it was over about 12 years in three increments that we got from uh, 45 board members to 21 board members. Uh, and that's served us well for the last 15 years or so. You know, I understand that, that that's been adopted by um, other community action agencies, that form of governance. Is that, tr is that true? That yes. Well, our governance is actually spelled out in federal law. And so every organization like ABC, um, there's 52 ABC-type organizations in uh, New York State. There's 1,000 across the country in urban and rural areas. Regardless of the size of their boards, all of those boards have seven members who are uh, elected or appointed officials, seven members who are from the private sector, and seven members who are representatives representatives of the poor. We call them consumer representatives on our board. Mm -hmm. So that's, and that was something that was put into the law in 1967. And when it was first put in, the whole purpose was to sort of get control of these agencies that had been created under the war in poverty mm -hmm. who were like, uh, causing a lot of politician headaches. Uh, but 
again, it's one of those things that was not well intended, but it's been a good thing because that meant the organization always had to be connected to uh, the community and different parts of the community. One of the things you're known for is not just for being out front, but also uh, working behind the scenes. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your approach to community leadership? Well, I think that if you're trying to you know, win the hearts and minds of people, uh, one of the best ways is to be in communication with them. Uh, so you can hear their ideas, you can hear that, you know, in, they can hear your ideas. Um, and so I've you know, been involved in many different um, you know, boards uh, and different committees uh, throughout the community uh, over the last uh, 25 years. Um, and so I believe that I've been able to uh, stimulate some change through those conversations uh, because every thing that needs to be done doesn't require a confrontation. So I think that I've raised awareness about what our agency is really about and how actually we are contributing to make the community better, as our name says, as opposed to just you know drawing on the public dollars um, and not use them effectively. Well, in addition to being behind the scenes, you've also said that it's important to be at the table where decisions are made, especially as a person of color and as a community leader. So you've worked both sides, and how, how did you achieve that, getting, getting uh, to be there at the table? Well, um, it was with the help of some board members and some staff people who had connections who knew about opportunities uh, that were available on some of these boards and committees. Um, and so when those opportunities became available, um, I took uh, advantage of them uh, to get involved um, so that, you know, as decisions are made, that a different voice could be, you know, put into the conversation uh, so that more considerations could be made before a decision is made. Mm -hmm. Do you ever find yourself, like, re really surprised uh, by the reaction of people when you were in that room? Uh, did you find that sometimes you were the only person of color in, in one of those decision-making rooms? Uh, that's probably more the, the rule than the exception. Uh, it's becoming less and less of an, of an exception. But uh, most um, of my career, that's been the, the rule. And, and oftentimes, you know, what I would have to contribute to the conversation would be things that just were not on the radar screen of some of the other people in the room. Um, and, so it's, it's, it's somewhat burdensome to, to have to play that role, uh, but it's a burden that a leader has to carry if you're a leader you know, from the, quote, minority community, uh, because um, you know, if you don't speak up, uh, sometimes what needs to be said won't be said. Is this what you mean when you say structural racism? Yeah, what I mean by structural racism, yes, is, is that we're talking about you know, policies, practices, uh, that are built into uh, the way a particular institution operates and how the inaction of those um, policies are reinforcing. Uh, so if, say, in the school system, um, we have a policy of pushing out the Latinos, pushing out the blacks um, when they're in junior high, high school, um, that results in them getting into what we call the the school to prison pipeline. Um, and then, of course, when they get into that particular system, uh, they lack the, the education and the training to uh, sort of get out of that system. When you get into the system, it's just hard to get out. You know, statistically, uh, there's a high percentage, somewhere around 60 70% of people, once they get in that system, they don't get out. They may get out a little bit, temporarily, but they end up back in that system. Was there an elected official or someone you really counted on as an ally in trying to change these disparities? Well, um, in here in Rochester? In, say, in Rochester or, well, anywhere that, that you, you've, over your, the course of your life, you've met with a lot of people in <laughs> yeah. a lot of powerful positions, yeah. not just here in Rochester. Yeah, well, one of the uh, people I mentioned uh, as my, my first professional mentor, uh, Mose Walker uh, in Kalamazoo, um, you know, he ran a community-based organization. Uh, and um, when he first ran his campaign for the city council, 
Um, I was sort of one of his campaign advisors, a photographer. Mm -hmm. I made brochures and things of that kind because I felt that that he had a perspective and a, and a passion for change that if he were able to get elected, which he did, um, he would be able to help bring about change. Um, when I was, you know, in, in Pontiac, um, you know, again, I was under a, a great leader uh, that he's the one, I would say, that taught me more about, uh, you know, being, you know, in the right seat, in the right meeting um, to help try to, you know, promote change. Um, you know, here in, in Rochester, of course, obviously, William Johnson, um, you know, coming from a human services agency background, uh, was one who I looked to uh, as one to help lead, lead about, you know, change. And I think that he did, you know, help um, organize our neighborhoods and actually help bring some attention to some of the neighborhoods that they weren't getting. And now, of course, you know, uh, the mayor um, is a, a very uh, strong um, advocate within the, uh, the anti-poverty initiative. Um, and um, so we're looking for continued leadership there. What do you think are some of the uh, liabilities in trying to, to uh, achieve this kind of change in, in Rochester? Well, I, I, I don't, I, I only see possibilities uh, from it being successful. But in order for it to be successful, it has to uh, be willing to, you know, deal with some of the fundamental uh, contributors to poverty. We know that there's the issue of, you know, transportation getting people to where the jobs are. Uh, so that's another area that we're you know, trying to address. We know that um, whereas we have uh, many bright spots you know, in our schools uh, that we're sort of like stuck as far as um, the, the standard measures for how we're progressing educationally with our low 50-ish, high 40-ish uh, graduation rate. Um, and so those are those are things that have to be addressed if we're going to actually move the needle uh, in regard to, to poverty. Well, looking back over 25 years at, at ABC, making a difference, what, what do you feel was your greatest achievement? Uh, well, I think one of, you know, saying the greatest is kind of hard. I think, I think one of the um, um, most significant achievements um, has been the um, the expansion of our early child services program. Um, so it's it's Head Start, and it's also EBK, enhanced pre-K, and universal pre-K, um, and uh, developing more partnerships in the community uh, with other groups. So we're involved with you know Rock Today, um, and uh, we're involved with the early childhood screenings uh, because. We believe, and uh, all the research shows, that uh, if these young people, if they get the right supports at the earliest stage of their lives, uh, then they more or less they get a certain sort of of, of uh, protection uh, from some of the uh, problems and barriers they're going to run into as they get older. So we know that a early childhood program that's of quality is going to result in people having better educational outcomes, less involvement in the criminal justice system, less dependency on the public health system, uh, better health outcomes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. When you look at some of the categories that Rochester uh, is in, they're, they're not places where you like to be number one, childhood poverty, uh, okay. low graduation rates. Is there anything, uh, looking back again, that you wish you had done differently or, or felt that maybe you could have made more of an impact? I think that we could have perhaps uh, made uh, more of an impact in the, the uh, employment area. Uh, we do have uh, employment uh, programs. Um, back in 1999, um, we were the uh, lead agency for a collaborative call catapults, um, you know, sort of a metaphor for, you know, mm -hmm. kicking people forward. And uh, we had a co-located operation of ABC and five other employment and training initiatives uh, that was really beginning to 
show some promise in terms of what are the benefits of a person being able to go to one location um, and access a range of services that they need. Um, but then about the time it began to uh, take off, there was a change in how the flow of federal funds came to the community for federal employment and training supported programs. We went, from, we went from the Job Training and Partnership Act uh, to the Workforce Investment Act at the time. And the um, influence, relative influence of the city versus the county sort of flipped. Um, and, and as a part of that, the attitude was, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater, we're going to do our own thing. Uh, and so sometimes we, we've had initiatives uh, that have started uh, that haven't been sustained. And um, unfortunately, um, you know, we've, we've had that issue in our community that uh, has been problems with, you know, goals for Greater Rochester, New Futures, um, uh, what is it, uh, um, Holland Children's Zone, uh, where we have, these, we have these starts, but then we can't finish. And so hopefully with the end of our initiative, we can finish. If you could just snap your fingers and change something, what would it be? Snap my fingers. Yeah, if I could do that, um, um, everybody will wake up tomorrow in Rochester and they would have a, um, a, a greater awareness and acknowledgement of structural inequalities within our society. Uh, and with a commitment also to change that, do something about it. I think that would make, I think that would make of the difference in the world. Um, so then when, when I talk about these problems, education, incarceration, uh, employment, uh, I think we would make progress in all those areas because we wouldn't be uh, not addressing what's real and what causes some of us not be able to, to get things done. Well, something tells me that uh, retirement isn't going to be just golf for you. Not uh, exactly. <laughs> so you have some ideas about staying active, staying on boards. Sure. Um, well, I, you know, I taught uh, sociology at MCC mm -hmm. from 1999 until 2015. Took a couple years break. Uh, my uh, next class starts on January 23rd. Um, I am um, doing a little. Uh, coaching with the Remerman, Remerman Leadership Group. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also going to be uh, doing some volunteer work with the Center for Community Engagement at St. John Fisher College. I'll be happy to um, join some of my retired colleagues um, doing that. And uh, there are some, some boards that I will continue to participate on, the Excellus Advisory Board, um, Common Ground Health until uh, later this year, uh, the Gateways, a music festival board, um, and some others. James, uh, it sounds like you're going to be busier in retirement than most of us are working full time. Well, uh, not trying to achieve that goal. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? One one thing that really intrigued me is I understand that you assign books to your staff uh, yep. to read. What what are these books about? It, I understand you're trying to make sure people really understand what you mean when you talk about structural racism or or why things are the way they are today. Yeah, you know, we we have a very diverse staff. Um, I would say one of the more diverse staff of any of the um, you know well-known human service organizations. And we come from different experiences, uh, different um, areas of expertise. Um, and so maybe uh, 20 years ago, uh, we started uh, trying to figure out how to build this common language, how to build this common culture. And uh, so we have our own little book club. Um, and um, it sort of the, the, the chapters get assigned out. Um, and um, every two or three weeks we have a meeting and the people present. Uh, and we alternate between management books uh, and books uh, that deal with social issues. Um, so it sort of not make it so routine. Uh, so we may read a book on coaching. Uh, last book we read was uh, Putnam's book, Our Kids, uh, where it talks about the challenges of addressing inequality um, in the 21st century versus how it was in the 20th century. Um, and so I think that's helpful because if I got people in finance, they, they think they just do finance. But no, they have, to, they have to know what we're trying to accomplish. 
and by having a greater understanding uh, of what uh, the people on the front lines are dealing with, I think it helps them be more sensitive to, uh, you know, being 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 a, a supplier of service to those parts of the organization. If you leave us a copy of the list, we'll put a link to it on our our website. Very good. And James, I, I'm sure I speak for uh, many many people in our community and certainly in our audience uh, in saying thank you for 25 years of trying to make this a, a better community and for helping so many people uh, as head of ABC. Thank you. We'll miss you, but I suspect uh, you're going to be around. Yeah, I hope, hope so. Hope to be around. <laughs> well, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. And thank you for watching. You can also catch this episode and past shows online at WXXI.org. We'll see you next time on Norm and Company.